Joe Boer was a senior colonel in the People's Liberation Army from 2003 until 2020 and was director of the Centre for International Security Cooperation at the Ministry of National Defence. He is now a senior fellow at the Centre for International Security and Strategy at Tsinghua University and he joins me from Beijing. It's good to have you with us. Senior Colonel Joe, can we talk about what China's intentions are in the Solomon Islands? Is the intention to establish a military base? Well, first of all, it's a request from Solomon government uh, for us to provide a kind of assistance uh, for maintaining security. So the request, first of all, comes from uh, the Solomon government. I don't believe uh, it is true that China would wish to establish a military base there. Though the question is, you know, China only has one logistic supply base in Djibouti to facilitate mm. the PLA's uh, counter-piracy operation in the Gulf of Aden, in which we actually had a cooperation with the Australian Navy as well. So there is no point for China to establish a uh, military and, and yet, base. And yet this has, been, this has been speculated about for some time. You mentioned Djibouti. Of course, there is also the port in Pakistan. China has claimed and, and militarised the disputed islands of the South China Sea. And there has been a lot of speculation about establishing a military base in the Pacific. Why wouldn't it then lead people to assume that, yes, China does indeed want to establish a military presence in the Solomon Islands? The answer is very simple, because China has no global military ambition, because China doesn't want to become a global policeman. That is why China so far has only uh, provided humanitarian aid to foreign countries in terms of military operations, be it peacekeeping, be it counterparty, be it disaster relief. If you put all Chinese military operation together, you would find their only military. But sir, uh, but sir, uh, we're not talking. We're not talking about a global aspiration. What we are talking about is a regional aspiration, and China has been very clear that it wants to establish itself as the preponderant power in the region. That's why China is increasing a military presence in the South China Sea. That's why we've seen uh, increased military exercises over Taiwan. And that's why China is increasing its presence in the Pacific, is it not? I think you put too many things together. Because uh, China has no global military uh, ambitions, therefore it doesn't need to establish a military base in the uh, South Pacific where China uh, apart from uh, economic uh, benefits, do not have any, doesn't have much uh, security concern. And when you talk about uh, South China Sea, we, you are actually referring to China's uh, sovereign rights yeah, in the South China Sea. When you talk disputed, about Taiwan, so that is disputed, disputed, and also, according to the International Maritime Court in The Hague, it was not to be claimed by any party, and China did that anyway. Well, uh, it is dispute, disputed, that is for sure, but China has its own claims based on history, be, based on its own interpretation of, of international law. So we in China believe uh, 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 that uh, the uh, islands and adjacent water in the South China Sea are China's sovereign territory Sen and territorial waters. Senior Colonel Joe, why, if, you, if indeed, as you say, China does not want to establish a military base or a military port, in the Solomons, why the need for the security pact in the first place? Why the need to create an opportunity for China to put more military presence under this security pact, which is potentially one of the outcomes? Why the need for it in the first place? Uh, and actually, I would ask you the, a question. Why are Australians so worried about this? Because you are certainly closer to Solomon Islands than China. And if you are worried about this China's security pact with uh, Solomon Islands, you actually are in a better position to provide it to the Solomon Islands. And why don't you do that? And why would you oppose to China doing well, that? I, I, and I, China I did this because uh, Solomon Islands asked for it. And I believe as a small nations, they probably would try, as all of them would do, a kind of a balance among major powers and, and uh, Australia is a major power for Solomon Islands. And so Australia has had a long relationship with the Solomon Islands and has deployed military there at various times as well and has a long relationship with aid to the Solomons as well. And Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, has been very clear. He has said that this is a red line. And if China was to indeed pursue establishing such a base, that it would be considered a red line. I want your interpretation of what that means. Well, How does China see that, a red line? 
I don't believe the Australian government is in any capacity to lay any red light for China's cooperation with Solomon Islands. Uh, uh, let me reiterate again, as uh, my government has said, that China has no intention whatsoever to establish a military base in Solomon Islands. Besides, we too are sovereign states, and we certainly are fully entitled to have whatever cooperation we want. So this has nothing to do with Australia. Well, it does have something to do with Australia because Australia is a Pacific nation and Australia has a long relationship with Pacific nations and a long relationship with a country like the Solomon Islands. Clearly, the United States is going to increase its presence in the Solomons as well. And now the Prime Minister is saying this is a red line. Again, I want to ask you, how does China interpret that language? Does that mean the potential conflict if indeed China looks to increase its military presence in the Solomons? Well, I believe you are not doing good enough. Otherwise, why would the Solomon Island government ask Chinese to help, since you are much closer? So won't you set your own soul to find out why the situation has actually happened? And so you should actually be in a better position to do that. And you should have done better. And why would you blame China? Because of requests from Solomon government. Again, you're not really answering the question about the red line and how China would perceive a red line. That, that is a message coming very clearly from Australia about a line that cannot be crossed. So how does China respond to that? How do you interpret language that says this is a red line that Australia will not allow to be crossed? Well, Stan, let me ask a question. So how do you, how do you interpret this red line? Would you specific, specify as to what the red line look like? And let me see then as a Chinese how we can probably not cross the red line. I don't believe the Australian government is in any capacity to lay such a, things like a red line for China. It is ridiculous. It is laughable for me. See, language like that, Senior Colonel Joe, um, it is laughable questioning Australia's interests in the Pacific. When you couple that with increasing military presence in the South China Sea, increasing military exercises over Taiwan, threats to reunify or take Taiwan by force, which Xi Jinping continues to talk about, does that not send a signal of increasing Chinese aggression in the region? No, I don't think so. Well, when you talk about a red line, that is extremely ridiculous in that, where is the red line? The red line is, is, is it, could you lay a red line in a sovereign state like Solomon Islands? It's not on any part of Australia. So how could you describe it as a red line? in terms of cooperation between sovereign states. When, and when you talk about uh, uh, Taiwan issue, 181 countries, including Australia, recognize it to be part of China. So what's the problem if we would use well, possible, we would possibly use force as a last resort only? What, what is the problem if you use force? Uh, are you seriously saying there is no problem if you use force against Taiwan, when Taiwan sees itself as a country pursuing its own interests, it carries out its own elections, it establishes relationships with the rest of the world um, from Taipei, to say that there is no problem if you use force, force that potentially could trigger a broader conflict involving the United States and Australia and lead to potentially catastrophic loss of life, and you say there is no problem with that? Well, you certainly uh, misinterpret me because uh, we would uh, uh, try, our, uh, try our most sincere wish to reunify with Taiwan uh, peacefully, but uh, use of force is still uh, maintained as a last possible resort if Taiwanese authority violates three conditions that is laid down clearly in our anti secession law. In this case, if they declare independence, they will have to use force. If there are major events that uh, uh, are used by foreign forces that cause a separation of Taiwan, we might use force. And then if the uh, mainland China concludes that all the conditions for peaceful reunification are exhausted, we might use force. So these are the three conditions that are laid down clearly in the anti secession law. It doesn't mean that we would use force freely or willingly. Senior Colonel Zhou, um, what does, Chi does Xi Jinping mean when he talks about a global security initiative? Yeah, he talked about many points and the most interesting thing is because of the background of his talk, because a lot of things uh, actually he said before, but this time I think what is the most uh, refreshing 
for any observer is uh, when he talked about how security arrangement should be effective, should be sustainable. Uh, so actually, I believe he's referring to the war in uh, Europe, uh, the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine. Of course, uh, uh, the security in Europe, I believe, now as in the past, is a, a deal between Russia and Europe. So unless and uh, until Russia and Europe or even NATO could come to agreement, well, the, the, the peace and prosperity in Europe he, is not he, he, hopeful. He, he has talked about this, this initiative as respecting sovereignty. How is Vladimir Putin, um, who has described Xi Jinping as his best friend and visited China during the Winter Olympics and then launched the war against Ukraine the day after the, the, the Winter Olympics ended, uh, why, how on earth could that be seen as respect for sovereignty, the very thing that Xi Jinping says that his global initiative is seeking to establish? And, and that is exactly why he would say that. He talking about the respect of sovereignty, regardless of which countries are involved. Yeah, so we are not uh, saying the, the wrong things. So that is exactly how he stressed sovereignty. But at the same time, uh, especially in this case, we talked about uh, the legitimate concern of Russia over NATO's Western, uh, Eastern world expansions. So all NATO, Russian leaders- NATO did not invade Russia. No country has invaded Russia, but Russia has invaded Ukraine. Why then does Xi Jinping not pick up the phone to his friend, Vladimir Putin, and call this off, bring his influence NATO to bear to end the conflict? NATO didn't invade Russia, but uh, NATO's uh, endless expansion have been warned time and again by all Russian leaders since Mikhail Gorbachev, but the West uh, simply would not uh, heed them at all until this time, the, until this time it had really backfired. So it's not that uh, uh, we're only talking about invasion. It's to prevent all these things from happening. Well, you should set yourself to ask yourself why this has happened after all. The NATO is growing. It might just uh, uh, claim that uh, its growth demonstrates its popularity, but its uh, popularity would invite risk to the security of Europe. As I said before, there's any security in Europe has to be arranged between Russia and NATO. Mm. Senior Colonel Joe, do you believe that we are now in a new Cold War? I think uh, to a great extent, yes. Uh, actually, I believe uh, we have uh, entered into a world with two Cold Wars. One is in Europe, after this hot war, definitely uh, a Cold War scenario will re-emerge in Europe. And in the Asia Pacific, uh, people do not talk about it openly, especially at the government level, but uh, uh, Donald Trump has actually ushered in this great power competition. And Joe Biden's policy is very much a follow-up. And Joe Biden's policy toward China is basically extreme competition, short of war. And, and if how, competition and, and is just, already extreme, isn't it a Cold War? What else can it be? And just finally on that, what about China's role in that, China's support for Russia, China's increasing militarization and its increasing threats to Taiwan? If indeed we are in a new Cold War, how much is China contributing to that? China can stand tall and firm because China is not a weight that would be added to the Russian side or to the American side like during, during the, the Cold War. Because uh, at that time, if you are weaker than the two sides that are stronger than you, your weight actually becomes important if it is added to one side. But China now is growing. China is becoming more important. Whatever has happened in the world, it could not change the fact that the world political economic shifts are moving toward the Asia Pacific with China standing right in the center. Senior Colonel Joe Ball, thank you again for giving us your time. Thank you.